Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be discussing adolescence and delinquency. Again, in our juvenile delinquency class, we're going to be thinking about deviations from social norms for people, you know, maybe under 18. But again, this is kind of where the debate is. In order to really understand our timelines, we have to take a developmental psychological approach to really discussing the brain evolution, brain development, the structure of the brain, how we grow over time, at what age are we considered an adult, at what age should we be treated like an adult. You know, from a uh, psychological standpoint, our brain is still growing until we're 25. Our prefrontal cortex that's responsible for most of our decision making really doesn't evolve until we are about 25. And so again, at what age are we an adult? Is it 18? Is it when we can drive a car? Is it when we hit puberty and can make babies? And you're going to find that this definition of what it means to be a juvenile or an adolescent or child in general, it varies with time and with context and with region, for example. In modern times, you might think of juveniles as anything under 18. And then once your 18th birthday comes, it's all over. But again, that's kind of a minimalist approach. We could consider it, you know, all the way up until 25. But again, is that just too long? Or is it just kind of like, you know, 16? You know, because traditionally you'll find like your book talks about, you know, the law was like, 16 that's an adult we'll treat you as an adult after that and then later on we were like never mind 18 you know however with the exception of murder well you know we won't treat an adult until you're 18 and so it varies so again when we're talking about these age ranges of juvenile though i think it's pretty good just to think you know maybe 0 to 18 is pretty good and same thing with like teen pregnancy you know a lot of my students will define teen pregnancy as like 0 to 19 but that's how a lot of research frames it also so again it's kind of arbitrary the phases of our life and how we code them um, but you can often think of like infancy you know up until 0 1 2 then toddlerhood and then, you know, early childhood, middle childhood, you know, teenage and adolescence, early adulthood, adulthood, late adulthood. And you can break up the timelines of our lifespan like that. But again, that's just us coming up with arbitrary categories. But again, when we're talking about adolescence. We're kind of looking at the age ranges of maybe 11 to 18 I'd say is maybe adolescence. Some might say it's more like 11 to 15. And then after that, it's like young adulthood. But again, it's kind of arbitrary. And then again, we're talking about delinquency. We're talking about things that deviate from cultural norms. It's us who decides what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And then we socialize and enforce those social norms or social rules about proper behavior and what's okay and what's not. And so again, it's us that labels things as delinquent or deviant, and, but that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Behavior that is labeled culturally deviant, committed by people around zero to 18. Okay, and that's a pretty good time frame of where we're at. All right, so adolescence and delinquency. The goals of this chapter are gonna to be to look at how does society treat adolescents today compared to the past, we're going to look at what are some typical high-risk behaviors and why do adolescents maybe engage in them more than adults. What does delinquency mean, as I'm saying, is deviating from cultural norms. Discussing things like status offenses, which are like not following the rules of your parents and how that can actually turn people into offenders in the um, criminal justice system. Uh, we're going to look at social responses to juvenile delinquents. Um, we're going to look at how we treat juvenile delinquents in modern times, okay? So, the typical teenage brain is not mature and young people are routinely characterized by poor judgment and impulsivity. Is there accuracy to this statement? And again, if I'm teaching developmental psychology, I'm gonna say things like this. From an evolutionary psychological standpoint, our brain is kind of set up for our judgment to kind of fall behind our desire to go out and seek things in the world including interactions with other people just conversations and sex and 
getting into things and doing things that might be considered dangerous or pushing boundaries to figure out how the world works. Your brain does drive you to go out in the world. And it's a really good question as to why does it take until you're like 25 for your better judgment, your executive level thinking to really kick in as well as it does? Why does it take 25 years for a human to develop that? Where our bodies are already driving us to go out and have sex and do these things, you know, by the time we hit puberty and beyond. And some fun arguments are that our brain often doesn't want us to think. If you think too much, or how many babies are you really going to have? So if you're not really thinking about it and you're just going out, you know, are you more likely to have babies? And so you got to think about it like that. But in the end, the teenage brain is not as fully developed as it will be when someone is 25. However, they're far beyond, you know, the ability to just think abstractly. Like the ability to think abstractly starts around 7, 8, 9, 10, and then by 12, 13, you really have a solid, you know, ability to think outside the box, you know, and, but it really, that kind of ability to think outside the box, to step outside of yourself, to like look at a situation from the outside doesn't develop as much as you think until a little bit later as you're getting into adulthood and early adulthood. And that's because the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain for self-control, judgment, planning, it matures slowly. And again, I think it's interesting that it matures so slowly compared to how much our bodies are already kind of ready before our brain really catches up, okay? Um, so that's just something interesting to think about. So it's not that teenagers can't make judgment it's just that that part of the brain that would you know make better decisions hasn't really fully developed okay the development of adulthood thought patterns and self-control is out of sync with the development of the brain meaning the body is a little bit ahead of the brain both you know in our intellectual thinking our emotional management um, understanding our motivations understanding our sense of self what we truly want things like that you often hear that teens engage in thrill-seeking behavior and again that goes back to the idea that your physical body is actually motivating you to go out and get into the world to get into things to seek stimuli you know from a psychology standpoint motivation drives exist for hunger for food for warmth for comfort you know we seek out stimuli however we might not be thinking as clearly as we should at that time when we're seeking out stimuli meaning that's kind of where the risk-taking behavior seemingly is coming involved and that they might not be thinking about the consequences or even caring about the consequences as much at a younger age as they might at a later age and again this is why teenagers are attracted to novel and risky activities especially with peers and again it's also during this phase that your body and your brain are pushing you to interact in the social context we are social beings we are driven motivated to interact with other people and once we get with those people do we engage in a little bit more wildness and that's a good argument for why crime is so much lower now than it was like in the 80s and the 90s when it was peaking. Because in the 80s and the 90s, we didn't have our technology and our phones. We were all just out with our friends on the streets getting into stuff. And in modern times, people are a little bit more on their phones, a little bit more isolated, not interacting as much, not dating as much, not having as much sex for teenagers too. Teenagers in modern times commit half as many drugs do half as many crimes and have half as many you know teenage pregnancy and sexual encounters as my generation did in the 80s and the 90s so i mean there are major trends um, and changes that do occur with culture and technology for example but again left to our own means what are kids going to get into you know we're going to get into life and so do teenagers need some structure? Of course. <laughs> so do they need to understand some consequences? Of course. Can they be held accountable and responsible at this age? That's where you get into a little debate. You know, yes, they can be held accountable, but were they really thinking as clearly as they would 10 years from now? You know what I mean? And that's kind of the good discussion. And this class will always take a biopsychosocial approach to juvenile delinquency 
meaning we'll talk about these biological processes and how they influence our behavior and the way we think. We'll talk about our thought processes, emotions, and you know how their perception of the social context and their experiences influence juvenile delinquency. And then we'll talk about the social context such as poverty, um, social interaction, people you're hanging out with, type of school you go to, um, culture you live in, and how all of these things are associated with, you know, criminality or just general deviating from social norms, okay? So again, it's a very broad class, and this lecture is a good introduction to it because it introduces a lot of ideas. I won't try to bog you down too much with this because there is a lot in this chapter, so make sure you take a little bit of time. The handling of juvenile delinquents throughout history has uh, changed. When you're talking about those eight processes or those eight periods, your book breaks it down into colonial, house of refuge area, juvenile courts, juvenile rights area, reform agenda area, social control and juvenile crime era, uh, delinquency and growing fear of crime area, and increased understanding of juvenile behavior. Meaning that over time, over the decades, as our attitudes have shifted, as our social policies have shifted, we as a society have acted differentially over time toward juvenile delinquency. Initially, your parents were the ones who were responsible for all your behavior. We didn't have a criminal justice system in place. So the colonial period is characterized by the family as a means of control. Then, as we got into urbanization during the Industrial Revolution, um, and you started to see a lot of urban problems, including high rates of poverty, um, single parents, whatever it might be during that time, you had a lot of children that were in need of some, you know, something, some kind of intervention. And so that's what they call the houses of refuge area, uh, where we started these early juvenile institutions, late 1800s, early 1900s. Then you have the juvenile court era as our society becomes more formalized and bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratized. That lasts, you know, probably about the 1920s through the 1950s. This is when the state starts to step in and kind of involve itself in domestic relations and the guardianship of children. Um, then you have the 1960s, which is the juvenile rights era. We started to think about things like childhood a lot more during this time. The idea of childhood itself has evolved over time. It wasn't like it is today, back in the day. Children were seen more as economic things. Like if when I'm teaching marriage and family, we talk about that. And, you know, they weren't necessarily, you know, the idea that we should like savor this childhood and create this beautiful imaginative childhood is generally, it's a recent invention. And so you definitely start to see this in the 50s and the 60s, this kind of stretching out of childhood. Like in the early 1900s, seven-year-old children were working in the factories. But by the 1960s, you know, we had outlawed child labor. We had set in place laws and policies to manage, you know, when children were allowed to work, for example. How we approach children and delinquents and the care of children and the foster care system, all of this starts to develop during this time, okay? But then there was kind of a big spike in crime. <laughs> and so the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, crime starts to really go up after the 1960s toward the 1990s, okay? And this is when they decide to get tough on crime. And so this kind of, you know, nice, happy, let's treat children a little bit differently in the 60s. By the 90s, we were all like, let's just lock up all the kids. We got to stop these juvenile hoodlums rampaging in the cities. But again, why was there high rates of crime for juveniles? Because in the 1950s and 1960s, the schools were integrated. And then you had this time of the white flight where anybody that was light-skinned and who had money hopped on the newly built interstates and built suburbs with good school systems. And the cities emptied out. And so all that was in the cities were poor people and minorities that were stuck being poor because of racism and ethnocentrism that sought to keep them in the lower classes. And so where there is poverty, there is crime. And so because the inner cities were so full of 
poverty, you started to see higher rates of crime, drug use, gangs, all of these things. And so that really spikes in the 90s, and you can always hear that in the classic rap music, which is no classic classic rap music because it was 30 years ago wow so apparently i'm getting old but again that was kind of when i was like a little kid you know during the time of the rap music but if you look at the statistics for crime you see that it was bad back then it was like the highest rates of crime in the 90s it just 60s and 90s and then now it's kind of backed off but they got really tough on crime during that time. So the social control in juvenile era is characterized by getting tough on juveniles. And then um, the increase of gang-related behavior in the 1990s just ramped it up even more. Now we're kind of at this reconciliation phase where we're still pretty hardcore. We have a criminal justice system in place, police, prosecutors, drug courts, all kinds of things in place and we are using them however we're also realizing that you know maybe there are other approaches and this opens up all kinds of possibilities because what happens when a kid gets in the system and so again think about like the generalized kid that ends up in juvenile court for example where are they coming from what was their home life what was their culture, their socioeconomic status? Who are they hanging around? What type of school did they go to? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? Do they have them? Have they experienced abuse and violence? You know, and so again, there's a whole other side to understanding this, right? So in sociology, we can focus on, you know, what we're seeing and what we're observing. And we can talk about these trends, like how is race associated with juvenile crime? Well, minorities were stuck in poverty. And if you stick entire races in poverty, are you going to see slightly higher rates of crime? You know what I mean? How is biological sex associated with poverty? Well, it's like 90% of crimes are committed by males. Well, why? Is it biology? Is it aggression? Testosterone? The way we think, you know, there's so many factors that we have to consider in this class to account for why does the social phenomenon of juvenile delinquency occur and what is going on in people's heads as they're doing it, the psychology of it all, and how is your body driving you to commit crimes? You know, is biology associated with violence and anger? I mean, think about it. Do you feel it in your body when you're angry, when you're upset, when you're mad, when you're defensive, you know? And so there's going to be a lot that we're going to have to talk about, but that's the increased understanding of juvenile behavior. I mean, it's, it's more than just some kid stepping out of line. What's going on in that kid's head? What's going on in that kid's life? What's that kid exposed to? Is the brain chemistry of that child associated with it? Again, that's biological factors, right? So it's incredibly complicated, all right? So again, um, these will probably come up on some quiz questions. Your book has some great charts, like the Colonial. Here's ones on all the charts with all the years and things like that for you guys for review. Uh, so definitely check those out. So again, the social conditions that, why does juvenile crime occur? Exposure to violence, long-term physical issues. Those kids are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, which perpetuates the situation, more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, PTSD, fail or have difficulty in school and end up becoming delinquent and engaging in criminal behavior. And so again, that biopsychosocial process, you can see it even just to account for social conditions. Well, is that kid acting out because they have anxiety as a result of experiencing some trauma in their life. You know, again, it's very complex. Children exposed to violence are at a higher risk of engaging in criminal behavior later in life also, and becoming participants in a cycle of violence. But again, this all breaks down to what happens when you're socialized into a culture of poverty, a social a culture of criminality, a culture of home life that is troubled, you know? What if you get exposed to sexual abuse? What if you're having psychological struggles, you know, psychological distress?
So again, some good things to consider. How are the brains of children and adults different? Again, you can focus on things like the development of the prefrontal cortex. You can focus on things like emotion management. Um, there's a lot here, so just some good stuff. Um, so juvenile delinquency, the primary subject matter of this class. What is this and what does it mean? Again, I opened up with this, but again, juveniles, I generally would think, you know, anywhere from 0 to 18. I mean, you're not going to see a big spike in crime when it comes to kids until, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is probably when it spikes the most. Um, but I think 0 to 18 is pretty good understanding for this class. And then delinquency is violating social norms. And this can be violating laws, like formal laws, you know, like robbery, uh, drug dealing, but it can also be violating social taboos, like not listening to your parents, being unruly, for example. And kids can get charged by the criminal justice system for unruly behavior, for example. I mean, you can kind of see where the family and the justice system and the state have, you know, are all interrelated in ways and that has happened over time which we'll talk about in a second but again how has the notion of childhood changed over time again early on there was no concept of childhood but over the generations we've extended that and now in modern times i mean i don't even know if childhood ends at 18. i really think in modern times especially with the rise of people still living with their parents a lot more than they used to, for example. Maybe it's even extended beyond that up to 25. It's a hard toss-up right now. We could just call it 18 because that's when you're legally an adult and just call it a day. But again, we have to think about the vocabulary and how we operationalize these definitions in broad ways. So popular stereotypes. Most people would say that a juvenile delinquent is a badly behaved teenager under 18 who gets in trouble with police frequently. You know, there's some truth to that. The image that comes to mind is an adolescent who skips school, drinks alcohol, uses illegal drugs, steals, is belligerent, and may be prone to violence. The popular notion of delinquency, however, is not an adequate definition for a discussion of juvenile practice and polity. It's too broad. So again, I like my biosocial, psychosocial approach. What's going on in the body and how is that driving you? And motivate you to engage in certain behaviors that could be labeled culturally deviant. What's going on in your head emotionally, cognitively, meaning how you think, and then when it comes to your motivations, desires, things along those lines. And then what's going on in the social context? What kind of socioeconomic status are they growing up in? What's the home life like? What's the social environment like? Who are they interacting with? What's the quality of the schools? moralities in the social context, whatever it might be. That's a better approach to this, okay? So the book's definition, though, of juvenile delinquency, an act committed by a minor, a minor, zero to, like, until they're 18, that violates the penal code of the government. So we're just sticking with the legal definition in this class. Again, zero to 17.99999. <laughs> okay? It's a law violation if it meets three criteria. One, the action is criminal if committed by an adult. Two, the young person is charged is below the age at which the court assumes jurisdiction. And this kind of fluctuates a little bit, which we'll get into. And then the juvenile is charged with an events that, offense that must be adjudicated in the juvenile court. Adolescence is the interval between childhood and adulthood. And again, you break it up into infancy, toddler, Early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence or teenager, and then, you know, early adult after 18 or however you want to code it, okay? Childhood and adolescence, again, is a term that has developed over many years as this concept has evolved. The concept of adolescence centers on a set of beliefs that emerged during the late 19th and 20th centuries, and since the 1930s, you've seen this expansion of childhood beyond seven years old, for example, up until about 18. The beliefs have resulted in removing young people from the world of employment and from the mainstream of adult society. Again, there's certain jobs you can't get until you're 18, for example. You have to have your parents' permission to do all kinds of stuff until you're 18. Again, you can't vote until you're 18. You know, you're not considered a citizen until you're 18. That's what that means, okay? And again, this concept of childhood started heavily into the 1960s and has evolved into what it is today. And just think to yourself, what does childhood mean to you? Okay, 
what is a typical adolescent in you? And that's pretty much what it is, okay? So check out some of the charts in your book, like the historical treatment versus the present treatment. We used to treat kids as small adults. Now we treat them as being prepared for adulthood, etc. So look over some of that. I just don't want to go over everything. It will be here for days. Again, when we're talking about youth culture and I'm asking what's going on in the social context, who are they interacting with, who are their friends, what kind of culture, belief systems, ideologies, ways of life are you being socialized into? What are your tastes? What do people do that you hang out with? Again, adolescents are connected to their peers. They're influenced and socialized by them. Adolescents and all ages of people are socialized by agents of socialization, okay? And so depending upon who you're exposed to and the social context that you grow up in, that dictates the way of life that you're socialized into. And hopefully you can see how if you're socialized into a way of life where, you know, stealing and doing drugs and smoking weed and stuff is considered normal with your culture, but not normal with the state, you're going to see some, you know, counter interactions there, for example. So we need to be thinking about culture from a sociological standpoint and the social context and how that structures your behavior and the way you think. Okay. So general stats of adolescence, there are 75 million children between zero and 17, taking up a quarter of the U S population. 60% Caucasian, 15% African American, 4% Asian, 24% Hispanic, Hispanic. One out of four are at risk for high behaviors, and one out of five children live below the poverty line. So again, you can start to hopefully see these associations where, you know, in areas of higher poverty, you're going to see higher rates of juvenile crime. Not to say they're the only ones who commit juvenile crimes, but that's just something that we have to consider, okay? And so when we look at who commits crimes by race, by age? You're going to see spikes at like 15, 16, and 17. You're going to see higher rates for uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Why? Poverty. You're going to see way less rates for Asians. Why? Cultural factors. And then, you know, whites are pretty representative when it comes to the crime. So the opportunity gap. Again, when we're talking about things like how does poverty affect your decisions and your opportunities, your hopes, your dreams, and what you can expect out of life and whether or not you can commit crimes. Again, just think about why is crime increase in high poverty areas, okay? Young people who grow up in disadvantaged settings, such as living in poverty, face barriers such as less access to jobs, less access to healthcare, less access to education system, Right. And so if you're not out there making a huge amount of money, living the American dream, right, what are you more likely to maybe start slinging crack on the side of the road, for example? And so I say that only because like when I've been to countries like Spain and the people that are selling drugs along the Mediterranean Sea tend to be the immigrants because the immigrants aren't allowed to get a job. And because they can't get a job, they have no other way to feed their family. So then they just go sell drugs to the tourists along the beach. And so you're always walking and people are always kind of hassling you about it as you go. But again, I, every, as a sociologist, I'm always asking myself, well, why is that person selling drugs? You know, and again, it's generally, you know, in Spain, I found most of them just because they weren't allowed to get a job. Spain was having a tough time economically at that time and the immigrants were struggling. Okay, so again, you got to ask, how is poverty associated with delinquency? How is poverty associated with your family's socioeconomic status? How is your family's socioeconomic status associated with your overall outcomes? And that's when, you know, you start to delve into the effect of inequality. Okay, so again, you know, where you're located in the class system is associated with things like crime rates. And again, it's because if you don't have things, what are you more likely to do? And is there higher rates of drugs where there's higher rates of poverty? Why is there higher rates of drug use where there's higher rates of poverty? Okay. And again, these are complex questions. And so that's the hard thing with sociology though, right? Just to answer that question, why 
are there are more drugs in areas of poverty like to answer that I just want to go to psychology like what is going on in the way they think is it the type of people that they're exposed to is it that there's just more options where there's poverty you know it's just really complex it's hard to answer that question and it does give me a stopgap because again I have to think about all the variables right yeah it's complicated high-risk behaviors high-risk use often experience multiple multiple difficulties they are socialized and economically stressed families and communities have a history of physical and sexual abuse have educational and vocational skill deficits and are prone to become involved in alcohol and other drug abuse and forms of delinquency and again that's the answer to my question but is that sufficient like again like i get that they're growing up in that world where they might not have a lot of options and a lot of hope but how does that lead to them making the decision to not just go work at mcdonald's and get two jobs and get out of poverty for example but to turn to things like crime and drug use and higher rates of violence and so again that's where i kind of get stop gapped because that's where sociology is so complex like that answer is not sufficient to me i need psychological information I also need some biological information like what are they are they just hungry and so because they're hungry and they don't have a job or any money they're like I need to sell some drugs to get food but then by selling drugs they get caught up in the criminal justice system and then now that they're in the criminal justice system and they have a record how is that gonna affect so sorry I just need to stop this really quick so I can change my battery again in general most kids don't end up delinquents what actually causes it and that's where it's very complex it's the biopsychosocial process we have to be considering and thinking about all these factors that might be associated with why someone deviates from the culturally established norms or maybe just the norms themselves need deviated from like in footloose if your society says you can't dance what are you going to do about it <laughs> However, as the problems that co-occur most frequently with serious delinquency increases, like doing alcohol, experiencing violence and trauma and abuse and lacking the skills necessary to do well in school, for example, so does the likelihood that an individual will become a serious delinquent. Compounding problems. And again, this is why I keep saying it's complex. Given one substance abuse related behavior, other substance behaviors become much more likely, for example. Uh, among youths who reported drinking alcohol, 23% of all youths aged 12 to 17, the level of marijuana use was 32%, and the level of drug selling was 23%, much higher that in, in, uh, than in those who don't drink, for example. And so what you start to see is as these kind of factors increase, like what kind of behaviors are you engaging in? Who are you hanging around? What's your culture like? What are you exposed to? What's your socioeconomic status? How do these things kind of compound and then lead toward engaging in acts that could end up you being labeled as juvenile delinquent, for example, okay? Hence the idea that the problems are all interrelated or links, okay? So for status offenses, status, status offenses are not considered crimes if adults were to commit them, such as being unruly or to not getting along with your parents. However, status offenses can end up with kids being stuck in the system. Three times as many youths are arrested for status offenses and property crime as for violent crimes, for example. Uh, truancy, running away from home, disobeying parents, all of this can get you in the criminal justice system, which can then even further compound the situation. Once you get labeled, once you're in the system, get on probation, then all of a sudden you're violating probation, then you get arrested again. Now you're, you know, having to spend a few weeks in jail. You might be missing school because you're in jail, um, whatever it might be. You know, you can kind of see how these problems compound. Uh, but so some three themes, you have delinquency prevention, 
delinquency across the life course and delinquency in social policy. So for in this class, we're going to be thinking about what can we do about things like status offenses? Um, how do we prevent delinquency? How do we, you know, think about delinquency across the life course and how that, you know, growing up as a juvenile and committing delinquent acts, how does that affect you in the overall life outcomes? And then thinking about social policy and how we should treat um, offenders. The idea of the state interacting with families and getting involved in things that are domestic was a process over time. I and mean, then the state, you know, in the end, thinking that it's kind of the ward of all of the citizens has evolved over time. And then this idea that the state has the right to intervene on a child's behalf evolved over time. Um, you start to definitely see it by the 1930s, 40s, 50s. This idea of parents patrie in juvenile courts becomes implemented. And this is the idea that the court system should, you know, intervene in cases in order to control the child for example so the government or any other authority regarded as the legal protector of citizens unable to protect themselves is this idea of parents patrie okay which kind of goes back late in history so again children are not able to protect themselves so should the government intervene so the government or any other authority regarded as the legal protector of citizens is, you know, for they come in for anyone that's not able to protect themselves, such as the helpless children, um, people that are suffering from mental problems, somebody that might be in a coma, for example, the court can take ward over these people. But with the, you know, okay, so that's this idea. So again, when we ask the question of when did the court system start intervening to control or manage the behavior of juveniles or children in general. It's an idea that evolved over time, but now we have a very formalized bureaucratic system in place in order to handle these situations, okay? So first, the courts may intervene when a youth has been accused of committing an act that would be a misdemeanor or felony if committed an adult. Second, the courts may intervene when a juvenile commits a certain status offense. Third, the courts may intervene in cases involving dependency or neglect, you know, problems with the family. Uh, for example, if a court determines that a child is being deprived or of needed support and supervision, it may be decided to remove the child from the home for his or her own protection. Hence, we have systems for um, social services to manage those cases. And today is not a good conversation for how efficient and effective is the court system and social services at managing what could be labeled a social problem, juvenile delinquency, uh, but that is something to be thinking about and that will come up in the future. Uh, again, courts have various definitions and age limits of what constitutes a juvenile. And so again, for this class, I keep saying 18, but again, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Missouri, Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, 17th birthday, okay? And then the, all the other states are 18th birthday. So again, for this class, 0 to 17 or 0 to 18, you know, but I think 18th birthday, you know, is, is about right generally for how it's kind of labeled. But as you can see, that gets extended that extra year through age 18, okay? Or I mean, up until your 18th birthday. But in these states, it's only until your 17th birthday. So status offenders in the courts, um... A status offense is a behavior that is an offense only because the person is involved as a juvenile, like talking back to your parents. Status offenders are known as minors in need of so social uh, supervision, um, children in need of supervision, juveniles in need of supervision, children in need of assistance, persons in need of a supervision, children in need of protective services, or members of families in need of supervision. All of these are just bureaucratic terms for when the state intervenes in these cases. Um, juveniles may be determined pre-delinquent, incorrigible, beyond control, ungovernable, or wayward in order to decide how to manage these children. Um, what these terms and acronyms have in common is that they view the status of vendor as being in need of supervision or assistance. Um, what jurisdiction, though, should the court have over children is that ethical and legal debate and philosophical debate. You know, at what point should the state be allowed to go into somebody's home and take the kids from the parents? At what point should the courts be allowed to arrest 
and you know lock up a kid you know just because the kid's not going to school like you know kids will get arrested for truancy and sent to jail if they don't go to school but you have to ask yourself is that ethical and is that what we as a society want to do and is that the best way to handle those kids and is that the best way to socialize those children to live in such a way where they can become productive citizens and have good outcomes in life and so we're always going to be asking the question throughout this class of what's the best way to manage these situations what's the best way to help people you know do we just chalk someone up you know because they committed a crime or are we about rehabilitation you know and that's the, always been the back and forth with criminal justice between punishment and rehabilitation right and so that is something we're going to think about throughout this class we'll talk more about that in the future you're starting to see this idea of the deinstitutionalization of status offenders movement it is growing in the sense that you know should we lock up a kid just because they talk back to their parents you know but at what point and how do we balance that situation you know that's going to be just the back and forth debates that you should be thinking about okay all right, cool. Crossover youth is something you're talked about, your book talks about. These are children that are exposed to both the social uh, welfare system or the social services and also the domestic courts or the juvenile courts, okay? And so think about what happens when kids end up in the systems. What does a kid really need to be happy? Just some food, some shelter, some love, and some comfort. And not every kid gets that, okay? And so a lot of kids lacking that support, for example, you know. And I have to stop myself here because just because someone has love and support, again, doesn't mean that they're not going to go out and commit crimes. But there are these associations between a kid having a happy childhood that's safe and secure it doesn't have to be rich you don't have to have tons of money or anything like that just some love and some comfort it goes back to the rhesus monkey experiment you know like the monkey yeah it'll go for the one wire monkey for the bottle but it likes to hang out with the soft monkey that's fake because it, it wants comfort little babies want comfort humans want comfort and a lot of kids don't get that and then how does that affect your psychology you know and then the way you think <laughs> so it's really sad you know to think that not every kid has this great awesome just woo life growing up you know but a lot of them don't and it's tough out there and you know and so I mean, again, that's a little heartbreaking every time I go to think about it. But again, not every kid has that. And so um, a lot of kids end up in the welfare system or social services or in foster care or in homes or in institutions of some kind. And it's very complex of how they end up there, but they do. And then uh, is that associated with, you know, an increased rise in delinquency and exposure to violence and abuse and drug abuse and things like that? And the answer is always yes, again. So depending on that social context, what your experiences are, that affects the way you think and the way you behave in your emotional state. And again, it's all very complex and interrelated, okay? So that's a good concept from the book. For this class, we are going to um, apply the developmental life course theory, which again is looking at how does the social context, the way you were raised, the way you grow up, the way you think as a kid affect you over time. And again, just like lower socioeconomic status is associated with less educational attainment, less job prestige, things along those lines. Same thing goes with like delinquency those growing up with higher rates of poverty that are exposed you know that are exposed to alcohol and drugs and abuse and you know again a lot of these things are associated or are risk factors associated with whether or not somebody engages in a crime for example uh, so for four main issues in the study of delinquency we're going to talk about is how does these behaviors develop again this biopsychosocial process of why are they committing these offenses and engaging in antisocial or just deviant like behavior? Um, we're going to look at protective factors. What can we do as a society to intervene to ensure that this doesn't happen? What are these risk factors at different ages?
you know, again, like I'm saying, things like race, biological sex, socioeconomic status, exposure to violence, drugs, alcohol abuse, things like that. And then how do these, you know, experiences in their younger days affect them over time and what are their overall outcomes, okay? So again, uh, hopefully I've been kind of drilling this into your head that this is kind of complex. Got to be thinking about these biological factors, what's motivating them, how are they feeling emotionally, um, what's going on in their head, how are they thinking, and then what's going on in the social context. So again, pretty complex, um, but again, that's why I like sociology. It's like one simple answer, there just isn't. We have to think about so many variables in order to account for why this happens. So if we go out and we go to do the research and we ask questions, what should we as a society do about this if we label it a social problem, okay? So again, doing research by collecting data, coming up with theories, trying to figure out what's up, um, you know, how do we apply this knowledge to incorporate a social policy to reduce juvenile delinquency and increase positive outcomes for all children? And so again, that's going to be the goal of this class is to have some scientifically backed research to support, you know, these philosophies of what we think is best. But again, over time, as society has evolved, as our population has grown, as our cities has, have grown, we have developed a formalized, bureaucratized, police enforced, prosecutor enforced, judge enforced, corrections enforced system to manage this situation but what are these variables associated with how somebody ends up in this situation and so that's the stuff i'm just going to keep listing over and over and over again what causes juvenile delinquency why do people deviate from social norms at young ages okay and if we can understand that then we can decide how best to treat manage these children and whether it's with psychiatric care or through criminal justice or with punishment or whatever it might be, maybe a system of rewards. Don't get in trouble. We give you a thousand dollars. You know, I never thought about that. That's a pretty cool idea, though. Like the government gives any kid who never gets arrested a thousand dollars on their 18th birthday, you know. <laughs> so maybe we'll end there on a happy thought. This is just a quick introduction to a lot of stuff. Um, and again, we're going to be delving deep throughout this class and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much and have a great day.